salute and howdy do. Welcome and greetings. There's my uh, <laughs> uh, happy typist who puts in the notes. And good evening to you, Leonard, and to everyone else. And yes, indeed, a happy and definitely blessed Wednesday night. It's October in the mountains. Uh, notice Psalms 9 through 15, number three. Uh, it's starting to happen. We're getting somewhere. And it's going to be really, uh, I think, kind of entertaining tonight. And you'll see why shortly as I pull out my, um, my shenanigans. But first of all, like it says here, I put my star up there, you know, and I always say tonight, blah, blah, blah. And then I put the star and I put, or should it be the star of David? And the reason for that is because it may help you to have some Hebrew orientation as we exegetically navigate in the Old Testament, the OT. And so tonight, I'm going, uh-oh, I got to check the gigabytes. You're right. It, I didn't check them, and it, I bet you anything it's messed up. Let's see. Uh, there. Right about now. <laughs> so let's see what that does. We are in 5G. And uh, I'll... Put this up. Yes, I'm checking. And yes, I changed them. And now, question Is it still fuzzy? And I really think it makes a big difference. You know, you go from, I think it's 2.4 gigs to 5 gigs. So it's double the oomph to give it a better resolution. And I guess that's why you pay double the price uh, if you do this. So, um, let me know, Leonard, it, uh, I bet you anything it's better. So I look forward to, to the report here shortly. Anyway, so, uh, as I was saying, hmm, hopefully this is less fuzzy too. Board looks fuzzy. All right. Well, hmm, not sure what I can do about that. I will do this temporarily, momentarily anyway, for, a, as I say, for a moment, I'm going to bring this up like that. So that, let me see if I can get this right here. I've got to figure out which way to, to do the camera. See, because I've still got to bring it up. Sorry about that. Some people are thinking they're at Six Flags or something because of the angles here. I keep uh, having a shift. Cleaning it up now. All right. Let me see if I can get it a little bit better and a little bit more. That's about as good as I can do for now, I'm trying to get the lighting out of there because of the reflection. But I want everybody to be able to see that, it says the star, or should it be the star, meaning the star of David? And that's because uh, I'm going to be helping you with the Hebrew. Sorry about all of these. I mean, to me, it reminds me of being on a ship. <laughs> but there you go. So anybody that can see that now, now I'm going to slowly uh, bring the laptop back to its designated location here where it's got to stay. And hopefully, let me see if I do that. Now, I know that that may make it fuzzier again, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, for the purposes of doing the... Uh, sharing of a couple of things that we're going to see tonight. Uh, I'm I'm going to plug in a particular. Let me see if I can do this and see if it'll show up. Yeah, there it is. Later on, we are going to be looking at pages such as this. And all right, so um, let me say, let me put in. Uh, that Leonard has chimed in here. Uh, how does it look as far as the, whatever you want to call this, the page that I'm inserting? I imagine because it's small, some of that may be hard to read. So Leonard, let me know if um, 
especially trying to get screenshots. I want people to be able to eventually screenshot this stuff or blow it up even if they get a screenshot and then be able to blow it up where you can read it. Um, I'm going, I have two of these. The other one's even smaller, unfortunately. Uh, I think I will pop that one up and let me see if I can get this one on the screen. Stop screen and then share. All this little red tape stuff I always have to do. Oh, good. I got a comment coming in. Um, let me get that up and let me put this one up. It's the one I said is smaller. Uh, and let's see. Oh, great. Good news. I love this one. Page is crystal clear. Now, this smaller one. Tell me what you think of that, too, uh, of page number two. Is page number two also very clear? It is smaller, so it may still be very clear, but just small. And I'm going to see if I can blow it up. For me, I can blow it up. I'm able to enlarge my screen. Now, the reason we're having all this stuff, and I'm, I'm going to take it out and then put it back after, okay? Uh, so I'm going to stop screen and go back to regular size here because we're still not done with the preliminaries, right? we got to get the night going here. Um, but uh, I like it that uh, it looks like the last comment. Let's see. Uh, okay, no, that was that from the first one. Anyway, bottom line is I'm going to give you, oh, look at this. Okay, clear but difficult to read. Okay, uh, it is smaller, but if I use that one second, you'll already be oriented because of the first one. Both of them are alphabet. And as I wrote here, um, it may help you to have some Hebrew orientation as we exegetically navigate in the Old Testament, uh, in the OT. And so the, the reason I'm doing this is I'm going to try, I got to show you these two books. This is the one, the first one with the bigger, uh, let me see if I can show you that page. Where is it? Oops, I went too far. Um, these two books are going to help people to understand stuff that I wrote in the introduction, the uh, title of the page. You're going to be able to understand a lot more. And remember, I'm trying to bring the scriptures to life always. And in order for that to happen, I've got to give you a lot of background, you know, background investigation and then uh, background information for you um, to help you understand things that are not explained and they're true. That's what's so fantastic. The stuff that I'm going to explain is true, but people don't understand it or don't have it explained because of the amount of detail involved. And therefore, I always say they don't trust the Bible. They don't trust pastors. They don't trust churches as a rule, you know, as an organization. Now, I don't blame them. And I want people to understand this, that it has to do not with trusting an organization like the Southern Baptist Convention or the Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church or any, you know, body, a religious body. And that's where we get into trouble. I also say, oh, and you don't trust a particular pastor. Well, that's the reason that you can freely come and go, free exercise the First Amendment. And what's the point of all that? Is that you are supposed to discern and figure out what's important. And how do you know? Well, I would tell you if you were uh, related to me in any way, shape, or form, and in this way, you're related as a, uh, a watcher and listener, <laughs> and uh, as friend, student, whatever, um, the thing I'm wanting you to know and believe and accept and understand and then trust, because there's times where you don't understand it yet and you trust it and then later you understand it. What I want people to know is that these writings, the scriptures, when they call them holy, you know, well, which ones are holy? Is the Quran holy? Are the Vedas holy? You know, I, 
You got to know about all the religions of the world. I have a book here. I'm not sure where, if it's handy here, uh, of the religions of the world, but I've got a bunch of them. And, oh, this is funny. Oh, I see. Hey, so I'm getting a, uh, a retweet on uh, Twitter from Yvonne and greetings. I'm glad you're here. Um, so what I was going to say, I was looking around here to see if I had my book that explains uh, the different religions of the world. It was one that I did in college. Yes, here it is. Um, not in seminary, not in graduate school, and not in a theological school, but to tell you, you know, because if you know my musical background, I was a musical director in Las Vegas for the Penthouse Magazine Pet Review, where we had all these naked ladies and uh, half-naked dancers and whatever else, and people would say, what? What kind of a theological uh, Christian or, you know, broadcast is this, you know? <laughs> well, it goes with this, right? The religions of the world. Some of them are pretty crazy. And um, and not so theological. And what I'm getting at here, and look, this book I got in, this one was in May of 1989 when I was at UNLV. And the reason that I'm bringing up religions and stuff is to say that they have so many, and especially over the period of history, so many different beliefs and, um, see, look, Here's the five pillars of Islam. And right here, you see all the Muslims. Uh, and look what it says. Are required to pray five times per day. Sometimes the prayers are private and sometimes large groups and Muslims pray together. And by the way, I was in Morocco at one point. I know I'm getting off the track here, but I do want to add some of this stuff because that's what makes these broadcasts worth watching. Um, I was with, in fact, two friends from Las Vegas, um, Heidi and uh, Missy, and they came to visit me in Spain. And what we did, we went on a little two week kind of vacation where I took them on some of the beaches of Spain. We went to a, a couple, we went to Portugal, went on a beach over there. Then with my friend Louis, uh, we got on a ferry from, where was it? Algeciras in the Southern tip of Spain, where you can see uh, the rock of Gibraltar. And we crossed uh, from literally the tip, the bottom of Spain, of Europe, and went across the opening from the Atlantic into the Mediterranean. We were right there and went to Tangier, Morocco, and spent, uh, I guess it was just a day. We just, you know, did the tour where we went. And, of course, uh, Heidi wanted to get a leather jacket. And there were all kinds of little goodies and, you know, uh, fun, what do you want to call it, uh, tours you know, things that you can do and go in the souk, the market, marketplace and uh, buy all kinds of things. And we had some fun that I can't get into here because I don't have the time. Uh, we did some fun shopping. And so we went to Morocco and we also went to Gibraltar with Lewis. And um, why was I bringing all this stuff up? What was it that I wanted to tell you? Oh, because all of a sudden when they have the call to prayer and you hear all this, oh, yeah. You know, and all this kind of stuff going on. It's like, oh man, get out of the street. And we got ushered real quickly into a shop where we could, you know, not be standing around in the street because it's disrespectful. It's during a prayer time. And if you're not praying right at that moment, you know, you might get snagged and thrown in jail or something. So um, the point is, these different religions of the world, some of them have really strange customs. And you can see Judaism down here and Christianity down here. And there's Islam right there. And so there's a whole bunch of all these different things that people, you know, uh, haven't studied. And, you know, they don't know what to believe. And this is what I'm telling you is in order to know what your, quote, theological persuasion has to offer and whether it's the truth or not, you need to have the proper, let's call it orientation and background, which is why I said here, may help to have some Hebrew orientation as we exegetically navigate in the Old Testament, the OT, versus the NT, the New Testament. And what I'm going to do is try to bring out some of the basics that you're going to need that's going to 
help to uh, make the Old Testament, as I said in uh, the title, at least for YouTube on the title there, make it come to life. And we do that with the New Testament also with New Testament history and you know the culture and civilization of the Greeks and things that happened and when the New Testament scriptures were written and where they were written. And then the same thing with the Old Testament, uh, when it was written, where it was written. And so you need to have the Greek background for the New Testament and the Hebrew background for the Old Testament because there's so much that's missing if you just explain some stuff in English and give a couple of tips and that's all everybody wants to know. They don't care about all the details and they want to, you know, what time is it? I think I want to get out of here now. Are we almost done? And they're bored to death. Well, I'm trying to bring this stuff to life. So tonight uh, we will continue in our usual manner, starting out with uh, a little bit of the preliminaries and introductory blah, blah, whereby I tell new people, if you're kind of new here, expect not to understand some of this. Please stick with it. Um, and I hope you can find previous weeks and get some out of it. Uh, things are coming and going, and I may be coming and going too, and I may need to change from uh, StreamYard to Rumble or something. Uh, I always put this board up to say we are not a religious broadcast. Why? Well, grace and the gospel are good news. But religion is not good news. See? And true or pure Christianity is not a religion. And if you think Christianity is a religion, then hear me out. Now, I will tell you, okay, this is not a religious broadcast, but I am a believer. I am a Christian. I'm even, if you want to get technical, an infralapsarian orthodox Christian. And that's a, a good designation amongst uh theologians and exegetes, where if I say that, then they'll start quizzing me and asking me questions because right away they know the difference between an ultralapsarian and an infralapsarian and uh, other, you know, persuasions of theological uh, differences and nuances. So um, what I do here is just try to explain to you so that you can really see some things you've never seen before and then have more confidence than ever that the scriptures are, as it says in Greek, theopneustos, they are God-breathed. And so it says, uh, all scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be mature, thoroughly furnished unto all good works, and, uh, you know, not be ashamed, you know, needeth not be ashamed, uh, correctly or rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay. And I think that's second Timothy two fifteen, uh, if I remember, but anyway, um, the point of all this is to say that there is a lot of detail. And when you have that detail, you can trust the scriptures and you can trust the teacher and you can build on a strong theological framework, I strongly recommend that if you haven't been watching Joe Griffin at uh, online, it's called uh, gdconline.org. It's gracedoctrinechurchonline.org, GDC. And you can watch Joe Griffin. He has a lot of charts. I have them too, but I haven't, uh, whatever you want to call that, necessarily put them up for a while. And I will eventually because we'll get more into the theological details. All right. Anyway, we're not going to go too long tonight because I want to just bring out, again, introductory stuff to help you have a better uh, handle on the Old Testament and particularly having to deal with Hebrew. And because immediately I have to show you stuff. And I'll give you an example right now. If I grab our text, where we are, we're going to be, uh, and I, I may get to it tonight if I go fast enough, um, to the notes, where you can start to see why this psalm, Psalm 9, is a bit different. Uh, let me see if I can show this. I'm going to point here with my finger. 
where it starts, Psalm 9. Underneath it, there are some squiggles, but look in the parentheses. There is an olive, okay? And if you look at verse 2 there, you see A, olive, same, same looking alphabet letter. And then if you keep reading, and it's from right to left, you can see another olive. And then the next line down, verse 3, olive. And then it's the first letter. Let me point to those uh, letters. That little squiggle, which is like that squiggle. You get them up close there. See, there's four of them in those two rows, four stanzas. Okay, in verses two and three. And then it goes to the next letter, which is a B, a baith. So I'm just going to show olive and baith because it keeps going from there, gimel, dalit, etc. But what I'm going to do now, very quickly, automatically, because I got the right page open, I'm going to show you those letters on the alphabet thing. Look, there's silent letter Aleph. And there's that second one, Baith. And then there's the Gimel. And then Dalit. And I'm going to be able to tell you a lot more about all this um, eventually. And what I should do right now is hold this up about this big. I think it's bigger and it's going to be informal. But look, it says alphabet chart. And let me hold it just like that. I'm going to leave that up for a minute so that anybody, you know, anybody who wants to get a screenshot of this, you can do so. And then what I'll do is I'll split it basically in half. And so I'm going to stop here in about five seconds. Let me see if I can go out chart there. I'm going to go uh, two, one. And now I'm going to kind of make it bigger. So if you want to get another screenshot, let's get the half that goes to, let's call it L or Lamed. And I'm trying to make that clear for a moment or two. So anybody who wants to get a screenshot of that, and then I'm going to get the bottom half. So I'm giving you a little bit of time to copy it. And remember, anybody who comes in late or uh, who wants to do a replay because you missed some of it or whatever, you can always get it again. Um, and so it'll come up again. All right, now I'm going to go from that L down so that we really get all of it and leave that up for a minute. And so, you know, a couple more seconds. I just want everybody to see all this. And I hope when I did the original one, yeah, that's right, because I got all the way up to the top there. I wanted you to see what it says on top with the pronunciation, book print, final form, you know, all that stuff. All right. So, um, and Leonard, I'd appreciate if you can give me a little note here that says you were able to get it and read it, uh, because I'm curious if you did, then maybe both right now others can, and as well on replays, others will. I'm hoping I left it up long enough for that purpose and for your benefit. So what I wanted to do tonight is mention about this alphabet, some things, and I, I want people to understand something about the difference between English and other languages. We've talked about Greek a lot, and I've given some help with that. Um, now I want to look at and compare English and Hebrew. And so this book, excellent. All right, I got the, uh, the what do you call it, seal of approval <laughs> uh, that Leonard was able to get it. And so get it, got it good, you know, that expression. Now, what I'm going to do is go to the previous page here and show you what it says. And we talk about uh, this information, this little bit of stuff. Um, in the English alphabet, number one, English is read from left to right, as you're reading right now, I or E-N-G-L-I-S-H, English, from the left to the right. Point two, in the English alphabet, there are 26 letters. Some are vowels, like A-E-I-O-U. Some are consonants, B, C, D, G, etc. And one is both, the Y which can end in a word like uh, uh, wonderfully, and it's an E, right? Wonderfully, vowel sound. Or it can be in the word yellow, and it's a yeah, 
And so that isn't, <laughs> that isn't really a vowel, right? A-E-I-O-U, yet. No, we don't have yet. Or yeah, or ye. Well, see right away, when you put that E at the end, it turns into a kind of a vowel. Now, look at Hebrew. The Hebrew alphabet is read from right to left. In Hebrew, there are 22 letters instead of 26, all in bold there, all of which are consonants. The vowels are added to the consonants in a special way, which we will discuss in the next chapter. How about that for some interesting tidbits of weirdness? You know, it's like, how, what's Hebrew like? Uh, what are other languages like? Well, how are they different? Look at this. Uh, in the alphabet chart, it says in column one, you'll find the pronunciation for each Hebrew letter. Uh, in this book, we use the Sephardic pronunciation. And there are two kinds of modern uh, and extant Hebrew. One is called, uh, you may have heard of this one, Ashkenazi. There's a music store called Sam Ash. And that name is from Samuel Ashkenazi. And they made it short in America and called it Ash, Sam Ash. But um, Ashkenazi is a European, Northern European, Northern continent, uh, you know, Judaism. Whereas the Sephardim and Sephardic is the African. And so you could say everywhere from uh, Morocco on the tip of the eastern northern part of Africa, and then all going all the way back over toward, uh, you know, Libya and Egypt and, you know, eventually uh, hitting the Levant, which is where Israel is, and the other countries above Israel, Syria and all that stuff, Lebanon. Um, all of that African lower section and then going all the way down to Africa, like the Ethiopians. See, there's Ethiopic in the ancient uh, Semitic cognate languages. And so all of that is the Sephardic side. And then the Northern and European, and so meaning all of the European continent and on the other side toward the Asian side where you have Turkey and the other northern uh, countries on that side going from what let's call the Middle East over more to the East. That's in the Ashkenazi area. And so notice it seems that the Sephardic one, look how it says right after, the pronunciation officially accepted by the state of Israel. Why? Because Israel is in the Sephardic side. And so here it says in column two, you'll find the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as they appear um, throughout the book. Uh, this type of lettering is called book print. Now let, let's not go any further and let me show this. Ah, I got to blow this up here. Um, what happened? How did it go away? Oh, I see. I didn't get it up. The close-ups of half the page turned out better. Oh, yeah, that's why I did it. I knew that um, from far away, it's kind of small. And if I just do half and then half, you get the whole thing. So thank you for pointing that out, Leonard, to, um, what would I say, uh, to confirm that it helped to do the halves. I figured just from what I can see and know uh, about all this stuff, uh, broadcasting and, and screen, uh, that it would help so that you really could see these details. So notice as I was reading in column one, there is what it says, for example, pronunciation. And they said in this book, you know, we're using the Sephardic pronunciation and that it's uh, official as used by Israel. In column two, you find the letters of the Hebrew alphabet as they appear in, throughout the book. So their book print shows you those letters so that every time we look at Hebrew words, let's go to uh, anywhere in the book. So for example, I'll go to uh, chapter four, page 19. As you see stuff, look at the Hebrew. All those letters are written, what we would call the book print, you know, book form. And so what's great about that is this page shows uh, number two, book print, and number five, where it says book print, because five, six, and seven show you the difference between book print, block, 
and script. Okay, so block would be the way you would write it in, you know, book print, but in script, you would write it like it is in column seven there. So a lot of stuff here. Again, I better show you the front of this book. Uh, I didn't do that yet. This is what I call the simple form, the first Hebrew primer for adults, biblical and prayer book Hebrew. Okay, and there, see all the letters? All of that is exactly the way you expect to see it in a Hebrew Bible. And so here we are in Psalm 9, Hebrew Bible, for real. Okay, and so if I blow it up a little bit so you can see it there, that's what we expect. And you guys don't have to learn Hebrew. Um, the more Hebrew you know, the better it's going to be for you because when I point out little details, you're going to go, oh, okay. And you'll be able to really link the details together, you know, like an alphabet letter with a whatever. So when I was showing you here that uh, uh, under the nine in bracket or in uh, parentheses is an olive. And then down by where verse four is, there's a base. Now look at verse four. It starts with that letter, that B with a dot in the middle of it. That's a dot, uh, a, um, uh, what do you call it? A, um, a dogesh. That's the dot. And if you look at the next stanza, there is a cough, which is K-O-P-H. It says, uh, Ya let's see, what is it? Yakashlu. Yakashlu, the next word there. And in that cough is a dot again. And there's also a dot at the end of the word in the oo part. And that, that's a vav with a dot in it, which makes it an oo instead of an o. Now I'm not gonna get into all these dots and details because we're not there today. And I still haven't. I'm really off here because we haven't had the time to pray. All right. So before I get any more carried away, because I'm going to end early here, real early, like in 20 or 30 minutes, uh, let's finish the introductory part and get in fellowship here. I'm sorry. I, of course, I got into grammar, so it, you don't have to be uh, in fellowship for grammar, right? But it helps because if it's biblical stuff, you'll even get more out of it. I promise. All right. So here we go. Um, this is our chart that I always show just before we get started, saying that if you are not a believer, you come to the foot of the cross, figuratively, and uh, and say to God, gee, I don't even know if you're real or I, I have never believed in, quote, you know, God. And, and then I got to say, you got to go a step further and believe in Christ. And you say, okay, well, I haven't done that either. Well, the Bible says, Acts 16, 31, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. And all you have to do is believe. It's faith alone and Christ alone. So it, during silent prayer, you can tell God that you are coming to faith in Christ. At that point, you will be filled with the Holy Spirit, put in the union with Christ or Mashiach, which means the anointed one, uh, the one who died on the cross for the sins of the world. And your sins will be forgiven. It's a fact, biblical fact, theologically uh, sound. Um, the filling of the Spirit is key. So these two circles, you get placed into union with Christ and filled with the spirit at salvation. If you sin, which you'll find out more about in general, um, and we do after salvation, you get out of this bottom circle and then you're controlled by your old sin nature, which is the way you were before you were a believer. And so for believers who get out of fellowship and controlled by the old sin nature because of personal sin, all you have to do is claim 1 John 1, 9. And I won't get into the details of that right now, because it's not necessary, but I will say we need to be filled with the Spirit. And so uh, if you want to get more out of this, let's take a moment for silent prayer and get ready, and then we will continue. So without further ado, let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you once again this evening for the opportunity to gather together and in this case, it's through electronic contrivances, but we are here to be in fellowship with you and to be filled with the spirit and to be able to understand things that we've either never heard before, or hopefully we will say that even if we have heard of it, it's a little clearer, we learned a little more. 
That's why we meet on a regular basis. Um, like in Hebrews 10, 25, forsake not the gathering of one another as the manner of some is, or, uh, some are, they don't get together and they don't worship and they don't grow spiritually. And as a result, our country is in the state that it's in. So we ask that you please will help us with that, that you will help and use us to further your plan and to help uh, get this nation back on its feet and out of the gutter and that you will bless this nation and that you will bless us individually. And that's why we're going to study the things we will look at tonight. And we thank you for all these things and ask them, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach in Christ's name, amen. And so voila. All right. So uh, the purpose of praying before we get going is to make sure we're filled with the spirit and in fellowship for those who might not know that. And here's why. Because when we want to study theological things, I always say biblical, theological, exegetical, spiritual, supernatural stuff. Um, we can't do it with our human you know, uh, what do you call that? Acumen are all the things in our brain that our brain can help us do. There are things that are beyond that. And that's in the realm of the spiritual and the supernatural and all that. And in order to get to that point, we need this supernatural spiritual apparatus that is the spiritual life. And that's why we have a moment of silent prayer so we can get ready. So now what I'm going to do is I'm going to give us a little bit of, of this background, some of this Hebrew stuff. I, I want you to see that the letters, and I'll just start with the top half, let's say, see if we can get that uh, nice and um, clear. Let me see how I can do this. There we go. And we can see that starting at the top, and I've numbered them a little bit, so you know what letter is which. You have this silent letter, and the name of the letter is Aleph. That's how we get A. Even in Greek, the first letter is, you know, Alpha. See, they're related. And the next letter is a, it looks like Bet, and it can be pronounced Bet, Beth, Bait. In different slight pronunciations. Kind of like when you say D-A-W-G, you know, it's a dog, you know, versus a dog. And uh, you can have coffee instead of coffee. And uh, you can be fixing in Texas to go from Dallas to Houston, from Dallas to Houston, Hugh, Houston. And, you know, you're fixing to go to Houston or fixing to go to Big D. Dallas. And so Beth, Bait, Bait, Beth, you know, Beth, quite a few different ways to pronounce that. Look at the next letter down, number three. It's a G as in girl, Gimel. Now, if you look carefully, there, it doesn't really exactly look like it, but the top part would be like a head. And the long part would be like a body and the bottom would be like a hoof or, you know, it's supposed to be. And when you see it written certain ways, like look at the block form, number six, that looks more like some kind of a head and a body and feet, you know, or legs. The reason I'm bringing that up to you is because a gimel in Hebrew means camel. And do you see how they get that out of that? They kind of get a G and a Gimel. And by the way, we spell camel with a C. It's the third letter of the alphabet. Camel. Now in Greek, it's alpha, beta, gamma. So gamma and camel, not exactly the same. But again, you're dealing with Greek, which is more European versus Gimel, which is more uh, Semitic and let's call it African or North Africa. As far as languages go, there's Indo-European and there's Semitic. Okay, so we're dealing with different issues here. But notice Alpha, Beta, Gamma, Aleph, Beit, Gimel. English, 
A, B, C. C can be like uh, to cease, C-E-A-S-E, cease, which is a soft C. But how about when you say case? What case is this? This is a terrible case. C becomes like a K. And we get that hard C as in camel. So why am I doing this? Why am I explaining this? Because I'm trying to explain the linguistics of it. And you can say, oh, yeah, it kind of goes together and makes sense. Okay, I'll keep going. D is as in door there. That letter under book print is Dalit. And that's the letter D in Hebrew. And then they don't go to E, A, B, C, D, E. They go to H as in house. And how do you pronounce that letter? The name of the letter? It's a hey. And it's also the, the, the letter with when you eventually put a, a, a uh, what do you call it? Uh, blank on my little um, Hirik Yod. When you get a Hirik Yod underneath that letter, uh, well, the Hirik is underneath it. It's a dot. And then to the left of it will be a Yod. The Yod is coming up, by the way. Look, letter number 10, as y, y as in yes. And see, it says Yod. See all the way over there on number 10, a couple about four or five down. Okay, when you have that to the left of this hey or H, and with a little dot underneath the H, it, it's pronounced high, and it means life. Some people have a necklace where they'll have the gold chain, and underneath it will be that letter dangling, you know, as a like when you have a cross or a star of David or that H. And high means life. And of course, it's a Jewish symbol for life. So we'll get into that. Now, the next letter is this weird thing called a Vav. See, under the name of the letters, uh, section four there. Vav or, uh, well, there's different pronunciations. I won't get into it now, but I'll just say that Vav there. Um, by itself, it can mean and, and it usually goes in front of a word and then it'll mean and something. So when you say in the beginning was the word and the word was, you know, or let's see in, in the beginning, uh, God created the, the earth. Let's see, what is it again? The heavens and the earth. And so when it says in the beginning, Bereshit bara in the beginning created and then it says Elohim, God, in the plural. And then it says, uh, let's see, in the beginning, God created, oh, Haaretz. Oh, no, uh, Hashemayim Vahaaretz. And that Vahaaretz is the Va from Vav. And that's where it says, and the earth. Okay, then you have this next sound, number seven there, Z as in zebra. It's called a Zion. And then the CH as in Bach. Now that is like hate. See down here, name of the letter, the hate. And so that's how it's pronounced. And that's why it says pronunciation, as in Bach, the real German pronunciation. We in English say Bach, but notice it's a CH and it's not Bach. It's not a CH as in church. And then you have Tet which is T as in tall. Yod, that's the smallest letter in Hebrew. We'll get into that in the future. Uh, and it's kind of a Y sound, as in yes. And then you have the K, which is a cough. And if you see there on the, under three, meaning in the columns there, final form, it has a final form. There are four others that have a final form, see? So there are five letters that have a final form. And then number 12 is the letter L, as in look, and that's called a Lamed. And that's a fancy looking one because on top it's got a big old curly Q. Uh, a lot of them just go straight down. That goes down over to the, when you're writing it, you go down and to the right and then uh, a squiggle down toward the left and to the bottom and about the center. And that's a Lamed. By the way, you can see less squiggles on the uh, in rows six and seven on the Lamed. Uh, they're more simple. That's how I write it, kind of like the block form. 
which is uh, column six. And then M as in mother, which is called a mem or mame. And you can see how that looks. And it's got a squarish looking thing. By the way, in uh, Korean, they do the same thing. They use that squarish looking thing for an M. And then you can see in block form, two ways to write it. And in script form, the weird part to me is the one that looks like a lot like an N, NP. You know, two different ways to write that. It was very weird. And I, I don't do the script form. I'm not at all comfortable with that. Whereas um, in Israel, Hebrew speakers, and, you know, as they're writing their notes and whatever, they would write it that way. I just don't, you know, don't deal with that because I'm not involved with um, modern Hebrew as much as I am. It, with Greek, I'm a little more involved with modern Greek only because I've been to Greek places like um, uh, the island of Crete where they write everything in Greek. So you see it in Greek and you'll see it in our Roman Latin letters. And so when it says something in Greek, I can read it. And then I see it in the Latin letters, like it'll say in English, you know, Crete. But when I see Crete in, in Greek, I can still read it. All right, so we got to this M as in mother, and that's the mem. We'll continue with the rest of it next time. Um, I, I'll continue with that. I, I just wanted to give you part of it today. The reason I'm stopping is so that we can get to the next part. Um, I wanted to get into some notes about the first couple of verses in, uh, in our text, which is Psalm 9. And so I'm going to grab the text both in the uh, Hebrew and, again, just show you the Hebrew and not bother reading it and not bother, you know, doing big details of it. But there it is. Uh, on top, if you got to go to this page to see where it says psalmi, which means psalms, it's plural from Latin. There it is in Hebrew. And then there is number nine, which means we're on Psalm nine. And I want to look at basically verses one, two, and three. And so let's take a look at the English text. If you have your English Bible, if you go to Psalm 9, then you can go with me to, uh, to read the first couple of verses. And this is my New American Standard Version. And it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. I will tell of thy wonders. I will be glad and exult in thee. I will sing peace to thy name, O Most High. When my enemies turn back, they stumble and perish before thee. Okay, so this says praise for victory over enemies. And part of the superscripture, as it's called, so not verse one, but above it, it says, for the choir director on Muth Laban, uh, a psalm of David. I'm going to explain that a little bit. And I wrote underneath that winners. Okay. And, you know, I got some notes there, odds and ends in English. So you can even catch it. So um, let's put that down. And from my notes, let's talk about what's there. Oh, let me put this marker back in its spot. And do I have everything in order here? Pretty much. I guess that'll do. Lots to, you know, to keep up with and keep track of as I try to do all this. All right. Um, oh, and by the way, next week as we continue in that big, um, you know, the big text there, uh, the primer uh, for simple Hebrew, We'll also get into this one. I will show you right now that other page that we saw that was smaller and hard to read. I'm going to hold that up for a couple of seconds so that you can get a better shot of it. And we could do it in halves as well. Uh, I want you to see that this page here is the alphabet, the whole alphabet. 
And what I'll do is I'll bring it up like we did before. Let me see if I can do this right. And I'm going to go to the uh, L part. Let me see where I can get this as big as I have to. Let me see. What does it say above it? Alphabet. All right. Well, I'm going to make it bigger. And so I'm going to cut some of the top off. But I want this to, let me get that straight. Hang on a minute before we try to get screenshots, if anyone does. Uh, hang on. Let me zoom in. All right. I think this will be as good as I can do, as close as I can get it to being somewhat clear. I know it's not as clear and it's smaller. So I'm going to leave that up for a second. And then I'm going to try again now. And hold it up and get the, the next part of it. So here will be part two. And so they overlap a little bit. Oh, yeah, let me get what's on the bottom there. And so I'm going to hold on to that for a minute so that you can copy what's there. This is more technical. Doesn't seem like it. But you'll notice the words on the left there where it says the name. They're a little bit weirder in some cases trying to explain what they are. Um, so uh, we'll get into more of this stuff only a little bit. I, I don't want to, you know, bore you to tears with the grammar and some of the important difficult stuff. But I do want you to know some of the basics of it because it's going to help bring things to life and more clarity and, you know, really uh, what's another good word for that? To make things lucid. You know, it means light, uh, loose in uh, L-U-C-E in Latin has to do with light. And also even in Spanish, it's L-U-Z, la luz, the light. So uh, as you can see, languages have a system to them and they connect. And when we go back to certain things that we've lost, we see better. We, we see more clearly and we see details. And so things come to life. And that's why I say we want that to happen. So let me mention a couple of points here, some things about Psalm 9, okay? First of all, it's a set of Psalms that we're going through, which is why I put on the board here, Psalms 9 through 15. Why? Well, they, as I mentioned the past couple of weeks, alternate uh, seven different Psalms, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Winner, loser, winner, loser, winner, loser, winner. Starts with winner, ends with winner. Four kinds of winners, three kinds of losers. Thank goodness there are more winners. And so it's a set of Psalms, and it's a unit of, let's break it down to winners and losers. And Psalms 9 and 10 may have originally been one psalm. And in the Septuagint, the LXX, which means the 70, L is the Roman numeral for 50, and X is the one for 10. So if you write LXX, it's 50 plus 20, you know, 50, 60, 70. And you say, okay, what's that? Well, there were 70 people involved in translating the Old Testament into Greek. And it's a very important uh, opus, you know, work. And in history and in theology, it is very, very important because we're able to compare the translations of the Greek and the Hebrew to see what did the Hebrew say and then how did they translate it and a lot of other things that help us to know what were older scriptures in Hebrew that were not changed, you know, because they had certain scriptures to do the translation in the LXX. So it's interesting that in the Septuagint, Psalms 9 and 10 are one psalm. Okay, now nine deals with winners and 10 deals with losers. Okay, we're talking about believers who are effectively living the 
let's call it Christ-centered life. At that time, you would have called it the Messiah-centered life. Um, so 10 are the losers, the ones that blew it. And, you know, they were believers, but they weren't uh, moving forward in their spiritual life and spiritual walk with God. So, um, as I mentioned, nine deals with winners and 10 deals with losers. And they are connected by form, which the word for that is acrostic. And what I mean by that is Psalm 9 goes from the letter A to letter K. So from Aleph to Kaf. And Psalm 10 continues the next letter in the Hebrew alphabet, Lamed, to the last letter, Tav. And we were looking at that tonight. Notice how I would give you half of them and then the other half. Generally speaking, that was kind of what I was trying to do. So um, there's strong evidence that Psalms 9 and 10 were one. And I'm not going to get into the details tonight. I may, in review next time, hit stuff I didn't hit tonight, where in verse 20, of chapter 9 and verse 18 of chapter 10, there's a connection. And uh, in chapter 9, you see certain verses like verses 5, 10, 17, 19, and 20. And you look at chapter 10, verse 16. There are connections in what is being said. I'll just leave it at that tonight because I'm doing a... Uh, a brief skim over stuff. Um, chapter nine, or I call it chapter, I should be saying uh, Psalm. Psalm nine is a triumphant Psalm of thanksgiving. And what is that? How is that? Well, it equals the grace mental attitude of the winner. What's up with the winner? The winner is occupied with Christ. Okay, now at that time they say, well, Christ didn't even exist yet for another thousand years. I go, yeah, yeah, well, you could call him the Messiah because he exists as the second person of the Trinity. And we call him Christ because Christos means anointed one. Well, guess what Mashiach means? Messiah, anointed one. So they're actually, um, Messiah is the Hebrew and old word for anointed. And then in Greek, from the Indo-European words, Christos is the equivalent. So both mean anointed one, Mashiach and Christos. And so uh, the grace mental attitude of the winner is someone who's occupied with Christ. Okay. Uh, Psalms 9 through 15 are all written by King David. And Psalm 9 was sung to, as it said in the... Uh, the super scripture above the text, uh, which is really a part of the text, it says, you know, let's see, how does it say it? For the chief choir director on Mut Laban, and it says, a psalm of David. Well, Mut Laban means nothing to us, right? English speakers. But what does it mean? In Hebrew, mut means death, and Laban means son. Uh, so from something to do with the death of the son. And um, there's three things to see in, in this psalm, in psalms. One is the music, which we don't have anymore. Two is the word of God, which we do have. And three is the doctrine in your soul related to the lyrics. So when you have doctrine, when you read these words, um, the, the let's call it the verses, verses one through three, um, doctrine in your soul lights up and says, ah, 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 I, I get it. It's about this, it's about this, it's about that. So what are these three things the music, the word of God, and the doctrine in your soul, they are a coordination or coordination of one, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and two, cognition of Bible doctrine. 
Remember I said there's music? That is the emotional context because the music should go with the eventually the words and the thinking, which are the word of God, which becomes doctrine in your soul. All right, so we're, we're getting started here. Now in verse one, it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart. There's that word, uh, L-E-B, lave. The B at the end is pronounced like a V. And uh, with all my heart, okay, here's the point. You worship in singing with all your heart, not, as you might believe, solely with your voice. When you worship in singing, you're using your voice, but it should be connected with your heart so that your heart, you sing from the heart, then that means that the words are coming from your innermost being, right? The inner part of you. That's why I say, when they say you believe with all your heart, you don't believe with the pump. The pump doesn't believe anything. It's a pump. It pumps. It's the heart of your being, which is dealing with what you think from your soul. So that's the kind of uh, spiritual thing we're getting into here. Now in Lamentations 3, verses 20 to 25, it's part of the song, the hymn, if you know it, Great is Thy Faithfulness. When you sing this hymn, you should be coordinating this, those words with the Bible doctrine in your soul. So the key is the cardia, now that's the Greek word, or the lay which is the Lamed in Hebrew and a Beth with a Tsere, which is two dots underneath the Lamed. So Lamed, Tsere, Beth, Lave, L, a long E at the bottom of the two dots and a B. By the way, the dots, those are the vowel pointings that were added later in the Hebrew language. Originally, if you knew Hebrew without the, uh, the vowels, you could still pronounce the words because you knew the language. And eventually the language was dying out. They added the vowels. Uh, the Masoretes did that eventually. And I think it was around 7th century BC. And eventually, or BCE, depending on who's talking, um, before the Common Era instead of before Christ, the vowel pointings were added later. So when you read a Hebrew text like I showed you earlier, the vowel pointings are in there. Those are the pointings that were added later by the Masoretes or Masoretes. Different people pronounce that, you know, uh, tomato, tomato. Um, and so as we continue here, verse two says, I will be glad and exult in thee. I will sing praise to thy name, O Most High. Got a lot to exegete here eventually. I'm just going to bring up this point that I will be glad and rejoice in you and worship. All right. At this point, we begin five points. And this is a good place to stop so that next time we can review these three verses and go over the five points having to do with, I will be glad, I will rejoice in you and worship. And that the key is, as it says, um, it says when it says, I will give thanks to the Lord with all my heart in verse one, the whole point is that word, the heart and verses one, two, and three express in detail what that is, what that means. And we'll see it with five points. And under point three, I've got seven sub points. So we'll get all that later. and. I think this is a good place to stop, and I'll tell you why. I'm getting ready to drive down to spend the very last night at my mom's house with my mom. She's been living there for 18 years, and tomorrow the Packers come. They don't load up the truck until Friday, and Saturday they bring the truck up here to her new place. And so tonight will be the last night. I'm glad I get to be there with mom 
to spend the last night with her in her house of 18 years, 90 miles away from here. And tomorrow night we will drive up here with the pup and we will spend tomorrow night and then Friday night here. And on Friday we'll run around some. And then on Saturday morning, the truck will show up and move her into her new place. And so that should be really great and really special. And so I would appreciate your remembering me in your daily and you know morning, day and night prayers uh, when you pray that the move goes well and that things work out because there's a lot of loose ends to tie. So, uh, but that's what I'm up to and it should be a fantastic weekend and we will celebrate her move up here. And then on Monday night, I will let you know how it went and what the latest is. So um, thank you for being here and checking out this beginning of our exegesis of Psalm 9. And you're already noticing how much there is to note, even in the first concept with the heart and the first three verses of chapter 9 and notes to come. And then how we're looking at the Hebrew to get a hang of all this stuff, get a handle on it, right? And uh, thank you, Leonard. Um, I hope that uh, you're enjoying this. Oh, I see that there's also another note here. Um, thank you and thank you in advance for the good result that I know is coming with this move. And uh, I'm, I think one of the reasons it went so fast is it wouldn't be good on mom to have to move for a long time, you know? I mean, this has been a uh, a whirlwind. It's called, by the way, in Hebrew, the word whirlwind, it is a hot Northern Sahara and the real Hebrew word and Semitic word for Arabic as well is Sa'ara. And if you take Sa'ara from the uh, Semitic cognate languages, from the Arabic and the Hebrew, you get what the British would say, and it was a, a Sahara, Sahara. See, that's where they get Sahara. And so it's a hot Western wind, actually Eastern. Is it Western or Eastern? Forget if it's the Western Sahara, and that makes it all of the Sahara, which goes to Eastern Africa. But anyway, Sahara is the word for a hot wind. And it's a whirlwind. And I'm telling you, this move has been a whirlwind. <laughs> and so, but I'm glad because if it had to last a long time, mom and I would both be wiped out, you know, from the move. So it is what it is. But thanks again for your prayers. And I'm going to call it a night and uh, we'll close in prayer. And then I'm going to get going. I pack a thing or two, get it in the car, get on down the road. And 90 minutes from leaving time here, I'll be down there and get to sleep early and get up early. And here goes nothing, as they say, you know, uh, the Packers come and and we head on out tomorrow night, head back up here. And mom will be officially a uh, Prescottonian. So uh, very interesting. All right. So let's close in prayer and we'll continue next time from there. Uh, let us pray. Thank you once again, Heavenly Father, for your grace. Thank you for all the things that you're doing in our lives everywhere, everybody, whoever's watching this. And even if you see it uh, uh, post haste in the future as a replay, uh, I pray that it will be a source of pleasure and edification, that it will um, encourage you and give you some more bits and pieces and details that that uh, make your heart happy, uh, like we're studying in Psalm 9 in the first couple verses already, uh, that it's with our heart that we sing and praise God and are happy. So we thank you for these things, and we ask them, as always, and here in Hebrew, uh, for real, B'Shem Yeshua HaMashiach, in the name of the uh, uh, Yeshua, who is the Savior, HaMashiach, who is the Christ or uh, the anointed one. And so we say in Christ's name, amen. There's the English version, right? Uh, in Christ's name, amen. So 
There you go. We're using the Hebrew. We're going back in time. We're not going back 2000. We're going almost about 3000 years. So how about that for old? All right. On that note, a good evening and be well. And thank you again. Got the good night from Len and see you on the next one. Have a great weekend. Look forward to our usual Monday night where we will continue with heathenism and good stuff. All right. So talk to you later and thank you for being here. Good night.